Κυρίε και κύριοι, καλησπέρα σα. Εκ μέρου του Διοικητικού Συμβουλίου του Κέντρου Αρχιτεκτονική Μεσογείου, σα καλωσορίζουμε στη δεύτερη κατά σειρά διάλεξη του, στο θεσμό τη διάλεξη χρονιά. Και φέτο έχουμε τη μεγάλη τύχη να έχουμε μαζί μα ένα πολύ σημαντικό άνθρωπο, τον καθηγητή Άντωνι Βίτλερ από, το, από τη σχολή τη Cooper Union τη uh, Νέα Υόρκη. Uh, At this point, I would like to thank Professor Widler on behalf of the Board of the Center of Mediterranean Architecture for accepting our invitation and uh, to say that we're, it's a great honor to have you with us. I want to thank Mr. Nico Patsavo for his contribution to this event, as well as Mr. Galiger for his contribution to this event. Η οργάνωση του γεγονότο. Uh, θα παρακαλούσα να κλείσετε όλοι τα κινητά σα για να μην έχουμε παρεμβολέ τόσο χητικέ όσο και στον εξοπλισμό τη αίθουσα. Uh, και τώρα θα παρακαλούσα τον Νίκο Πατσαβό, που είναι ο μεταφραστή του βιβλίου Workspace του Άντωνι Βίτλε στα ελληνικά, να προλογίσει τον κύριο Βίτλε. Ε, καλησπέρα και από μένα και από τον συμμεταφραστή, τον παλιό μας φοιτητή και απόφητο, τον Βαγγέλη τον Πεκιαρίδη. Ε, η, η έκδοση του World Space ε, συνέπεσε με την εκδήλωση σήμερα στο ΚΑΜ. Ε, εξ αρχής θα λέγαμε ότι υπήρχε μια σχέση ανάμεσα στα δύο γεγονότα και την Παρασκευή στην Αθήνα, στην Αρχαιολογική Εταιρεία, θα έχουμε την παρουσία στην πρώτη του βιβλίου. Ε, ευχαριστώ οπότε και γι' αυτό τον καθηγητή Βίτλερ που βρέθηκε μαζί μας ε, καταρχήν για τη μεγάλη διάλεξη σήμερα, για τη δημόσια διάλεξη και μας υποστήριξε και στην διαδικασία επιμέλειας και μετάφρασης του βιβλίου. Ε, καταρχήν σε σχέση με την σημερινή πρόσκληση, ίσως περισσεύει και περιτεύει το να ε, προσπαθήσω να εξηγήσω με τον οποιοδήποτε τρόπο γιατί θα μπορούσε να είναι μια καλή επιλογή για όλους εμάς το να ακούσουμε από κοντά και να έχουμε την ευκαιρία να συζητήσουμε μαζί με τον Άντωνη Βίτλερ. Κατά μία έννοια εδώ και πάρα πολλά χρόνια όλοι εμείς που σπουδάζουμε αρχιτεκτονική και σκεφτόμαστε για την αρχιτεκτονική έχουμε συζητήσει μαζί του μέσα από τα α, πολύ σημαντικά βιβλία του όπως το World Space, όπως το The Architectural Uncanny ε, αλλά και μέσα από τη σειρά άρθρων που έχει εδώ και δεκαετίες δημοσιεύσει σε πολύ σημαντικά περιοδικά αρχιτεκτονικής και τέχνης όπως το Architectural Design, το Perspecta, το Positions, το Art Forum, το Lotus International και πολλά άλλα. Το October, το Grey Room, το Architectural Review, το Log. Ε, απλά να δώσουμε, να υπενθυμίσουμε μάλλον κάποια ελάχιστα στοιχεία για το πολύ πλούσιο βιογραφικό του. Έχει διατελέσει κοσμήτορας, πρόεδρος και καθηγητής στις, ίσως στις σημαντικότερες σχολές στην Αμερική, όπως η Cooper Union, το UCLA, το Cornell, το Yale και το Princeton. Ε, το συγγραφικό του έργο έχει δημοσιευτεί, ε, ως, σε, ιδιαίτερα σε ό,τι αφορά τα τελευταία του έργα, κυρίως από το MIT Press, αλλά και τον ελβετικό οίκο Birkhauser, και έχει δημοσιευτεί ταυτόχρονα και σε πολλές άλλες γλώσσες, ιδιαίτερα στα γαλλικά, τα ιταλικά και τα ισπανικά, που σχεδόν τα περισσότερα έργα του έχουν μεταφραστεί, και πλέον και στα ελληνικά. Ε, το θέμα της διάλεξης, Second Best Architecture, Design Between Utopia and Catastrophe, προσπαθήσαμε να το αποδώσουμε ως η αμέσως καλύτερη αρχιτεκτονική, σχεδιάζοντας ανάμεσα στην ουτοπία και την καταστροφή. Ε, είναι ένα θέμα το οποίο κατά βάση το επέλεξε ο κύριος Βίτλιο προκειμένου να απευθυνθεί ιδιαίτερα στους νέους αρχιτέκτονες και τους φοιτητέ της Σχολής Αρχιτεκτών του Πολυτεχνείου Κρήτης. Και στην ουσία μέσα από μια επισκόπηση, θα λέγαμε, τόσο του θεωρητικού διαλόγου αλλά και πραγματικών σημαντικών συμβάντων στην αρχιτεκτονική, τον πολιτισμό και ευρύτερα στον πλανήτη μας τα τελευταία τουλάχιστον 10-15 χρόνια, επιχειρεί όχι απλά μια ανασκόπηση αυτών των εξελίξεων, αλλά μια απάντηση, θα λέγαμε, ή τέλο πάντων μια συζήτηση γύρω από ένα πολύ σημαντικό ερώτημα, που είναι το κίνητρο τελικά που μπορεί να έχει ο νέος αρχιτέκτονας για να βγει στο πολύ, ε, ανταπ, ε, πολύ 
απαιτητικό στάδιο της επαγγελματικής πρακτικής στην αρχιτεκτονική. Ε, έχει να κάνει δηλαδή με το κατά πόσον μέσα σε ένα περιβάλλον μιας διαπιστωμένης καταστροφής σε πολλά επίπεδα, κοινωνικό, οικολογικό κτλ. Θα λέγαμε ότι οι ουτοπίες που μπορεί να ακολούθησαν και τις γενιές της αμέσως προηγούμενες, η διάψευση ή μη αυτών των ουτοπιών, κατά πόσο θα μπορούσαν συνδιαλεγόμενες αυτές οι ουτοπίες με το περιβάλλον αυτό της κρίσης να επιτρέψουν μια καινούργια ηθική και ένα καινούργιο κίνητρο στις νέες γενιές των αρχιτεκτών. Σταματάω λοιπόν εδώ εγώ και ε, καλώ τον κύριο Βίτλε να πάρει το βήμα. Thank you so much for this kind uh, introduction. I want to thank the uh, Center for Mediterranean Architecture and its uh, representatives here. Uh, I want to also thank uh, 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 Dimitri. Uh, Nikos and Jorgos uh, for their help. Um, I have always wanted, uh, ever since I was 15 years old, uh, and opened a work uh, uh, which uh, displayed all the pictures in full color of Arthur Evans' uh, imaginary restoration of Knossos. I've always wanted to go to Knossos, and so uh, with the help of uh, Nikos, uh, yesterday uh, I finally um, achieved my dream. So Crete uh, is uh, an extraordinary experience for me, and I'm deeply, deeply appreciative of the invitation to, to come here. Uh, before talking about uh, architecture between utopia and catastrophe, I want to talk about a rather living and uh, immediate uh, apparent catastrophe that we saw on, uh, on live, uh, uh, live video uh, only uh, two nights ago. Uh, do we do that? Yes. Uh, it, it brought to mind uh, one of the uh, crucial events, both in terms of the history of architecture and the history of uh, warfare and the history of uh, critical theory and uh, imagination uh, of, uh, of 1914, uh, where the bombs of uh, the German army uh, uh, strafed the uh, town of Reims, um, and uh, eventually by uh, the 18th of, uh, uh, the 18th of uh, December, Uh, set it on fire. It, it not only uh, gave rise to one of the most uh, important investigations into how to restore and how to rebuild uh, Gothic cathedrals uh, in uh, the 20th century, but interesting enough, it also gave rise to some of the most powerful critical theories of uh, form, architecture, and uh, counter-architecture. Uh, the first uh, essay by Georges Bataille uh, in his uh, life, published in a, uh, a journal on the uh, catastrophe of France. So uh, when we uh, saw this uh, our two nights ago, in our case, uh, a phone call from New York from our son who adores this cathedral, uh, we uh, were suitably terrified and, uh, and shocked. Um, there is a, a moment, however, where we can now reflect, given the, the towers and most of the nave, uh, with damage to the transept and the roof, uh, we could now reflect on another question, another problem of catastrophe and restoration and rebuilding, which is the fact that most of the, art, most of the physical artifacts that were destroyed, uh, the roof, Uh, the spire and the uh, transept were not the work of medieval architects, but were, were the work uh, between 1844 and 1856 of uh, Eugène Ville le Duc, uh, the French uh, restorer. Um, we uh, uh, witnessed actually the day before the fire uh, of the uh, the. Uh, the miraculous lifting up from the spire of the uh, of 16 uh, 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 copper uh, uh, statues of, uh, of the apostles, um, one of which, amusingly enough, uh, well, the apostles, this, these statues were taken for restoration. They were completely designed uh, by Ville le Duc, uh, as was the spire, it was designed and built uh, in wood and uh, uh, covered in lead. Uh, with these uh, statues, I was amused to read uh, that Villa the Duke had substituted for the head of the Atossal St. Thomas his own uh, self-portrait, which I suppose architects always love to try to do. So 
in the sense of how we are uh, going to begin to look at this particular uh, restoration after catastrophe, we also have to understand that a great deal of the, uh, the supposedly medieval uh, nature of this uh, building uh, was in fact uh, several times destroyed and, 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 uh, and, uh, and rebuilt. The, in 1789, in the uh, revolution, the statues of the kings were, were taken down and beheaded in the public square. Uh, the big bells were meant to down for cannon, uh, cannonballs. Uh, the sacristy itself uh, was burned down. Uh, and uh, when uh, uh, Ville Duc got to it in, uh, in 1844 to 1846, uh, he wanted uh, to restore it. Now, one of the interesting things about restoration in the 19th century, especially uh, Ville Duc, was the contrast between uh, two forms or two fundamental ideas of restoration. One was uh, that of John Ruskin, who was absolutely against any kind of restoration. He didn't believe that uh, uh, modern society had the uh, equipment, the ideas, the forms, or the workers uh, who could uh, put into any restoration of a, certainly a medieval work, uh, put into the kind of energy, passion, and form uh, could never reproduce because the society made the architecture, the society had changed. So for his vision, he said, draw, draw, draw until it falls down. Ville le Duc, on the other hand, had an uh, an imaginary of restoration uh, where in his uh, great dictionary of architecture he said to restore is to bring a medieval work to a state more perfect even than its originators were able to achieve. So he believed that his Gothic was better than any other Gothic had ever been because he knew the principles of Gothic and could then rebuild a medieval cathedral and did try much across France itself to a more perfect original state. And so he designed the spire, he built it out of wood covered in lead, he, he topped it uh, with a, uh, a, a, a figure of a rooster and uh, then uh, added, in, uh, added in 1935 was a, 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 a Met of, I guess, I guess it was a, a model of the uh, crown of thorns, uh, all of which uh, fell. The question now, of course, is to whether to restore this medieval building to the state of which it was before Ville le Duc, or whether to treat Ville le Duc's restorations as historical architecture in themselves. He was understandably a good architect, a great architect. And so do we restore it to Ville le Duc's uh, 18, uh, 19, 1848 to 1856, or we, do we restore it to something we imagine it was before Ville le Duc got there? So there's a, going to be at least 30 years, I guarantee, of debate uh, around the restoration, and probably at least 10 of those years uh, will in, ensue before anybody in the municipality or in the, uh, in the office of, uh, of the historic uh, monument historique, uh, to decide what kind of restoration can go ahead, which I, I give uh, 30 years before there's a new roof for uh, uh, Notre Dame. So I'm pleased, today what I want to talk about uh, is the stories that architects tell themselves and the stories that architects are told by those who understand or pretend to understand the nature of the society in which architects work. And of course, the stories that architects tell themselves have a kind of narrative form, a narrative form that often imitates, emulates the narrative form of the stories that philosophers, uh, economists, uh, political scientists, and other experts in society tell about the society itself and interweave, therefore, in the narratives that uh, architects tell uh, there are the narratives that philosophers and uh, politicians tell. And so tonight what I want to do is to talk about 12 narratives, uh, 12 narratives that from the time of Plato to the present, uh, architects have told, them, to, told themselves in relationship to the narratives that historians and politicians and, of course, philosophers have told. And let's be clear, what I'm really trying to investigate. And these are questions which we can have a discussion about after this lecture. They're questions which I have with my students all the time. Are these narratives something that can give us a clue as to how to operate in the context of the stories we tell? Uh, let's, let's start. I'm interested then 
My talk this evening considers the way in which we think of architecture in history and the way in which its historical framing influences, for better or for worse, how we think and design architecture today. I speak of the narratives, the stories we tell and have heard throughout the last two centuries that attempt to explain architecture to us, and by us, I mean all those who are concerned with the invention, development, and production of architecture today, and especially the students, whose mission is to develop architecture tomorrow. These stories, as the historian of the environment, William Cronin, points out, with respect to stories told about the environment, have beginnings, middles, and ends that are calculated to produce certain results. They are neither histories nor chronicles, but narratives, the beginnings of which predicate the defined end. I begin, and I'll return in the end, to the celebrated statement that, according to Plato, was made on, at Crete, on Crete uh, in a walk from Knossos to Mount Ida, the Athenian visitor, and I now work from Plato's laws. So this is the first narrative that I'll be talking about. What is ideal and how can the ideal in some way or another uh, be mediated by the real? The Athenian visitor, and this is Plato's last and very long discourse, which I guarantee almost nobody who talks about it has read to the end. The Athenian visitor has been invited to the island to advise a Cretan and his Spartan companion on the proper form of a new settlement, established as far as possible to ensure that its citizens will live a life of harmonia and justice in a city without stasis, without civil war, undivided and unified, and designed for justice in the whole and the individual, what is normally understood as the platonic utopia. They draw up the plans for this city as they walk from Knossos to Mount Ida, no doubt to propitiate Zeus, the first lawgiver to King Midas, Minos, who was born in a cave on the side of Mount Ida. At a certain point, even the Athenian realizes that their idealist propositions are just too ideal. That, for example, the absolute equality of women, the unification of a population drawn from other existing cities, and that they'll have to compromise. Hence his proposal that while keeping the ideal in mind, it may be more practical to settle for what is usually translated in English as the second best or even the third best version uh, or constitution uh, or, co or, or constitution no higher than the second point in el excellence, that's one translation. In French, a city of the second rank or even the third rank. And I give you uh, the Greek from Plato and the general English translation of uh, this particular passage. The idea that while you keep the ideal in mind, you nevertheless strive for something which is realizable. I won't enter into the various and long drawn out interpretations of Plato's meaning here, but I just want to hold us to hold in mind that this move from the absolute paradigma to its second or third form is in fact the move in design that we all and, uh, operate, that we have since Plato through the Renaissance and into the modern movement understood as the archetypal method of architectural invention from an ideal type to the reformulation in a more pragmatic, less than ideal way. And starting with Plato, and installed in architectural thought by Vitruvius, that's the second narrative of my 12, these moves from the ideal to the real, the idea or form to its material manifestation, has been given its authority by stories. Stories that have been repeated so often in so many different versions that they become ingrained in the very thought processes of what we call architectural design. So in what follows, I want to trace the impact of these narratives on architecture. Narratives that are given purpose, authority, and often a formal vocabulary to architecture, and those stories on which we now rely on for the same purpose. The general thrust of my argument 
is that the early stories about architecture, which we inherit from Vitruvius, are stories that are fundamentally geared to telling us how to make architecture, what to do about architecture, what kind of proportions architecture should have, the fact that architecture, the temple, for example, comes from the wooden structure of the hut, tells us uh, what are the metopes, what are the proportions of the dark, tells us about architecture. And my idea, I think, uh, and especially uh, hearing uh, the very large narratives that uh, we hear uh, today should shape our, our world, the narrative of ecological uh, disaster, of the Anthropocene, of the, uh, the end of uh, civilization on Earth, uh, that maybe these narratives demand mediation to the point where we have to understand how within those narratives to make another architectural narrative that tells us what to do because a lot of my students will say, and a lot of people I talk to, will say how hopeless we feel in this long span which comes to a dead end in the end of civilization, the end of life on Earth, and so on. If you read the titles of, of these uh, of cataclysmic books, uh, it gives us no sense as architects of what we might do, as opposed to the narratives uh, from, uh, from, uh, from history. I focus on narratives rather than histories because of the strange effect narratives and not histories have had as the mythic structure of our field. The narratives that give context and meaning to an otherwise abstract and unauthorized discipline, as uh, Vitruvius himself said, an art and a science that society can very well do without, often imposed on society without his permission. An art that Hegel noticed simply shapes stone, which has no meaning until it's called stone, as having some meaning in itself. But it doesn't embody that meaning. We tell it that it has that meaning. And if we call it architecture, or if we call it shelter, or if we call it building, or if we call it just something that we've built, uh, we have to define what it is that makes it architecture as opposed to something else. And I'm asking, what story should we tell ourselves today will make us understand what we do as architecture within the big global tradition of understanding uh, the long process of ecological uh, degradation of uh, uh, the Anthropocene? In the beginning, and um, this story of stories begins like every story, architectural stories were all grand narratives vested in all the authority of philosophy and history, often combined. From the primitive hut of Vitruvius, conceived as the paradigm of shelter, to the enlightenment ideal of the primal model, to those more historically understood typologies of the 19th century, and therefore there to the theories of typical form underlying the modern movement, this way of thinking has endured. Here we have uh, one of the Renaissance uh, uh, illustrations of the first uh, primitive huts uh, built uh, and described in one of the first editions of Vitruvius. And the, the notion that uh, in parallel with the Vitruvian model, there is also a, uh, a, across the world, there are many models of this uh, particular religious model. There's a, a sense that building, uh, building uh, the medieval cathedrals was in fact a story of building the temple, uh, building a kind of uh, a rest retribution for the Tower of Babel, and in the Renaissance, again, the building of the hut moving uh, to the uh, temple. The third narrative emerged in the Enlightenment. It was a moment where uh, the thinkers of the middle of the 18th century, Diderot, Voltaire, and, uh, and uh, D'Alembert, the editors of the uh, great encyclopedia, wanted to dispel with myths and develop a reasonable understanding of how to conduct production in a society where that production would ameliorate the society and lead to the perfection of society. Here we have the uh, architect Ledoux uh, giving us his very celebrated engraving of uh, what the architect can do for the world. Here's the poor uh, little man sitting on a stone which he has no way of cutting, no way of uh, understanding how to turn into architecture. Uh, but there, uh, up in the sky, is the architect with all the gods ready to descend 
on this poor man and make him a proper shelter uh, as opposed to a simple tree. And uh, that particular idea of enlightenment perfection, of rationalism, of the idea of rationalizing all the arts and the sciences into a method of characterization, of classification, of organization, of hierarchies, was picked up at the end of the 18th century and the beginning of the 19th century as an architectural method, taking Jean-Nicolas Durand, who was actually uh, established by uh, Napoleon in the first école uh, polytechnique in the polytechnic tradition as opposed to the Beaux-Arts tradition and categorizing all the monuments of the past into different building types and then abstracting from them a way of organizing and composing those building types into point lines and planes that could be organized with the new graph paper uh, that Gaspar Monge, the inventor of graph paper, the inventor of the axon the metric, the inventor of uh, <coughs> the inventor of architectural education at the beginning of the 19th century, uh, understood. So we have a, a, a different story here. Now we have the beginnings of a story which from the Enlightenment looked back at the entire history of architecture, identified the monuments of architecture, identified how they could be used as reference points to new monuments of a si same or different type. And there is his, uh, uh, the frontispiece to his book, uh, where he uh, examines and compares all the monuments of uh, historical uh, architecture. Throughout the 19th century, uh, we heard new narratives, narratives of progress from the primitive origins to the present, sometimes based on the enlightened vision of continuing progress in knowledge, sometimes based on Hegel's grand track trajectory of the arts from the symbolic to the classic to the romantic, where the final unity of art and thought and civic subject rendered architecture relatively without a sharing role. This narrative was, in the 1860s, fueled by the Darwinian idea of evolution. Architecture and its styles evolving from one from the other, growing like a tree from a central root and joined to each society by its function as a kind of of language, a language that spoke the spirit of the age, the zeitgeist. And we have uh, here Sir John Soane at the beginning of the, uh, of the, of the uh, 19th century uh, displaying in this kind of museum of historical typologies all his projects, showing his projects as a kind of evolutionary tree of architecture, an evolutionary tree of architecture that like all nature was also fated to die and to fall into ruin. Here, this is a technique that many of you uh, might want to, uh, it was very successful for John Sohn. He had the project for the Bank of England, one of the biggest projects in London of the early 19th century. And uh, instead of showing them his project, he showed them a vision of his project ruined and demonstrated to them that his project would make better ruins in 2,000 years than Rome itself. So if you can demonstrate that your ruined project will be better than, your real, than, be better than any other ruined project, uh, you might get the commission. The development of the sciences, the developments of anthropology, the developments of sociology, the developments of all the academic sciences towards the end of the century. Uh, Gottfried Semper was one of the major thinkers that pushed the real, uh, the realist understanding of uh, ar architecture from the uh, most primitive huts to the, uh, the, the huts that were made. He saw this uh, Caribbean hut in the Great Exhibition of, uh, of 1851 and saw it as the, as the key to the fundamental elements of architecture. So we have here someone who's looking at the real anthropological and sociological uh, roots of architecture, the, the continuing of architecture in society in this present day and moving towards uh, the proposition that uh, a uh, narrative could be made uh, of progress from this, that, that Caribbean hut, for example, to the temple of the Great Exposition of 1851, the glass house that Paxton wrote of uh, that. And Villiers the Duke the same. Uh, he took the principles of Gothic composition, of Gothic structure, and developed them, uh, as we've just been uh, saying, of perfection. And it was Nietzsche who uh, 
basically killed these narratives. They basically uh, uh, constructed a, a, a vision of society and life and, uh, and, uh, and form uh, that uh, was totally embraced uh, by many of the uh, architects of the early, uh, the late, late 18th, 19th century and the early uh, 20th century, Henri van der Velde to Le Corbusier included. Uh, the sense that, uh, as he says, uh, to be sure we need history but we need it in a manner different from the way in which the spoilt idler in the garden of knowledge uses it, no matter how elegantly he may look down on our coarse and graceless needs and distresses. That is, we need history for life and action, not for a comfortable turning away from life and action, or merely from glossing over the egotistical life and the cowardly bad act. We wish to use history only insofar as it serves living. In three respects, history belongs to the living person. It belongs to him as an active and striving person. It belongs to him as a person who preserves and admires. It belongs to him as a suffering person in need of emancipation. This trinity of relationships corresponds to a trinity of methods for history to the extent that one may make the distinctions a monumental method, an antiquarian method, and a critical method. The monumental method in, uh, in, uh, in Nietzsche's understanding uh, was that which looked to the past uh, found monuments in the past that could monumentalize activity in the present. In his terms, it stultified, it fixed, and, uh, and, 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 and stopped any kind of progress. An antiquarian method was that which continued to look in the past, in the past, in the past, with absolutely no lessons and no understanding of, of the present. And a critical method was, of course, one that used those uh, visions of the past to jump into the future. And nobody jumped into the future more passionately uh, than the futurists uh, in Italy in, uh, in the very late 18th, 19th and early 20th century. And of course, here's Filippo Tommaso Marinetti in his uh, racing car. And you know, the, uh, those of you who don't know should read uh, the beginning of the Futurist Manifesto, which speaks of, uh, of uh, Marinetti and his friends in this uh, or horribly uh, uh, stuffy apartment of their parents with, their, with its uh, draperies and its stuffed, uh, stuffed furniture and, its, uh, and all its uh, 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 trappings, uh, woke up early in the morning and rushed out into the, uh, into the uh, street and got into their racing cars and turned them up and raced into the, uh, raced into the uh, suburbs of, uh, of, uh, of Milan, one of the, the, the major emancipating futurist acts, uh, of course emancipating futurist acts that later the futurist uh, uh, really uh, converted into a rather uh, difficult philosophy of power of uh, anti-feminism and later uh, fascism. But nevertheless, the, the Futurist Manifesto uh, geared up for a forgetting of the past and a move into the future that was important for the Russian constructivists in their revolution and for the avant-garde uh, throughout, uh, throughout history. And here we have uh, uh, Marinetti's uh, extraordinary words in liberty. Uh, the words themselves only onomatopoeic and, uh, and sonically uh, constructing uh, a whole poem of their own and the, uh, the noise of the street enters that of the house, the continuous uh, intercession of uh, a story, therefore, of uh, deconstruction and construction uh, through a kind of Nietzschean vision of, uh, of power. A Nietzschean vision of power which was tamed slightly in Le Corbusier, but nevertheless uh, had a strong hold on the, uh, on the purists and the uh, Corbusians of the, uh, of the early 20s, uh, where he saw uh, architecture uh, struggling out of the Middle Ages and moving into, uh, moving into classicism, uh, moving from uh, the sense of uh, perfection of the Parthenon, but the equal perfection of the designed implements. And uh, uh, actually, uh, Steve Jobs would have loved this uh, particular uh, quote, architecture is in the telephone and in the Parthenon. Uh, it's a, a quotation that uh, resonates, I think, at a moment when uh, people were trying to separate out monumental architecture as architecture and all the rest as building. There's that wonderful uh, and very, very dangerous phrase that emerges at the beginning of the historian Nicholas Pevsner's uh, book, uh, Outline of European Architecture, where he says, a bicycle shed is a building. Lincoln Cathedral, a cathedral is a piece of architecture. 
a sense of dividing building and architecture which became so pernicious in the 1920s and 1930s and 1940s, and even now, I would say, uh, becomes a, uh, a, a block uh, to treating construction, to treating uh, a whole series of shelters, a whole series of questions of shelter um, as architecture, which I would uh, propose. And here we have uh, the racing car again, uh, Corbusier uh, seeing a kind of... Uh, of, of uh, of progression of movement from the uh, imperfect uh, pestum to the perfect uh, Parthenon on the right, uh, and the imperfect, of course, for the Corbusier, uh, the British uh, 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 Humber, uh, with its uh, sit up and beg, uh, 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 almost like a kind of horse and carriage, with, a, with the horse being on the front, being a, a motor engine, and the carriage being just designed like every other horse and carriage in the back, and then the, the car that Corbusier always wanted to own and in the end did own uh, the Delage Transport uh, where uh, all is streamlined and all is, per all is perfection. It is the Parthenon of the auto industry. And uh, then a narrative that cuts all narratives into a kind of silence. Uh, the narrative that, uh, that emerges at the end of uh, the shocking and unmentionable and unimaginable events of the, uh, of the Second World War. Gunther Anders, the, uh, uh, the philosopher from Vienna, uh, noting, after Hiroshima, I was not able for many years to recover as a writer. In the first moment, I remained silent, not because I had not understood the monstrousness of the event, but because to the contrary, my imagination, my thought, my mouth, and my skin all refused to work in the face of the monstrousness of the event. Very, very parallel to those statements by uh, Theodor Adorno, after, how, after Auschwitz, no more art. After Auschwitz, how can we uh, produce art? And this image uh, haunted uh, the imaginations and the experiences of uh, architects who had either fought in the Second World War or who grew up uh, immediately after the Second World War, the images of ruins. I, uh, this is uh, uh, one of the... Uh, points I often make in relationship to the so-called brutalist architecture, the heavy concrete architecture that emerged in most of the, of the American and, uh, and European and in most of the uh, uh, rest of the world uh, after the Second World War, uh, you see uh, that many of them served a purpose. Many of the heaviness, many of the containment, many of the lack of windows served the purpose uh, where, in fact, when you go into the uh, American cities and see those, uh, see those buildings, you always see on the, uh, on, the, on the corner down below the fallout shelter sign. So a, there was a reason for their bunker-like appearance, what Paul Verilio called uh, a little bit later uh, bunker architecture. There was a reason for them. And, of course, after the, uh, with, the, with the first shock of the, of, of the war over a generation grew up, uh, that was uh, receiving that shock in history and in the uh, received uh, videos and, uh, and films and, uh, of course, interviews, the Shoah interviews, uh, the full shock of the, and horror of what had happened during uh, 1941 to 1945 came uh, to be realized by the artists and the uh, architects of, uh, of this generation. Uh, Hals Rucker uh, playing with the, the notion of, uh, of uh, ironically playing with the notion of security and safely in a, in a post-atomic uh, environment. Uh, Guy Debord, uh, the situationist, uh, uh, who uh, I remember once, uh, once said, uh, nous sommes uh, enfants perdus, we are lost children. Why? Because we had no sense of the possibility of survival uh, beyond a certain age, given the standoff of the nuclear powers uh, in the period of the 50s and 60s. This ironic uh, uh, and very, very brilliant article on the uh, shelter, um, the shelter program of the United States launched by uh, Kennedy uh, in the uh, 1960s where, uh, as De Boer writes in this uh, particular piece, uh, the American real estate industry has persuaded everybody in the suburbs to build one house above ground. Now it can sell them one house, another house, a second house below ground. Uh, and uh, basically understanding the, uh, the relationship of the, of the uh, movement of capital uh, and the movement of real estate uh, to the movement of war. And uh, when asked, uh, what about tomorrow? The Smithsons, in a very, very uh, powerful move, 
uh, described two possible tomorrows. Uh, this is the exhibition uh, in the ICA of the uh, 1956. And uh, tomorrow for the Smithsons. On the one hand, this is largely Peter Smithsons and uh, Eduardo um, uh, Carazzoni and uh, the extraordinary uh, uh, blown up uh, post-apocalyptic head uh, which is made out of a collage by Nigel Henderson, the photographer. If you get up close to that head, it's made out of a collage of, uh, of uh, aerial photographs from bombing missions over, 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 over Germany. So there's a sense uh, that this is the, the last shelter. It's the shelter which is after the uh, apocalypse, after the catastrophe. Uh, there you see the head of man uh, in the actual uh, collage. And then if you look at what Alison Smithson uh, was doing at the same time for the House of the Future exhibition, the What is Tomorrow, House of the Future, the House of the Future for Alison Smithson uh, was an airlocked bunker. It was an airlocked shed uh, which uh, would resist uh, the kinds of tragedy that uh, Coventry, here's the bombing of Coventry Cathedral. And here, for example, is the Smithson's early contribution to the to the Coventry Cathedral uh, rebuilding plan where they said no, all we need is this warped plane sliding across the ruins uh, to remind us uh, all the time of the temporality, of the fragility, of the uh, lack of permanence of architecture in the post-atomic uh, world or even when they are producing their golden lane uh, uh, schemes, see seeing them emerging out of this uh, uh, out of these ruins. And uh, this, I think, is, is uh, a very prevalent, uh, it's the haunting uh, of, uh, of a generation uh, after uh, Hiroshima. And no one was haunted more uh, than Arata Isosaki in his 1968 re-ruined uh, Hiroshima, where he takes the photographs of, uh, of Hiroshima, which uh, had only quite recently been uh, allowed uh, to circulate by the, uh, by the Americans after the uh, occupation of Japan and given them another, another formulation, uh, another city uh, which was built and then ruined again. And I want to uh, just give you this, uh, this long piece by Isosaki to give you a sense of the, of the power of this, uh, which I call one of the uh, major narratives, which I think still haunts us. As a boy of 14, I saw the cities of Japan burnt to the ground before my eyes. Running through the rapidly collapsing streets like a hunted animal, I escaped the incendiary bombs. This was uh, Tokyo. Not the complete and other, but the com not the complete and other destruction of everything I knew, which ensued in their wake. All the physical objects in my world and everything around disappeared. It seems as if some fabric of life, even the bonds of family and other human relations were reduced to so many piles of rubbish. There was not a cloud in that sky over the Japanese archipelago on, that day, on the day Japan surrendered. The summer sun cast sharp black shadows on the ground. It was silent. And I've spoken, of course, just earlier of the silence that was uh, imposed on writers like Gunther Anders, uh, Gustav Anders, where, where Gunther Anders, where he uh, was reduced to silence uh, by the uh, event. Time stopped. Moreover, it was the end of history. All explosion, dangers around, and all that so clearly constituted the future disappeared. One had to call it a void. As I stood long in that void, only the blue sky came up. My mind and body dropped away, and I had no additional mental capacity to be self-aware. However, to recall a few of those moments, I believe it was a feeling of despondency under the blue skies. At that time, the spectacle that spread before me was the plan of burnt ruins. The combined effects was psychologically traumatic. Etched into my very retina in that moment when suddenly time stopped, whose burnt ruins would come back to me every time I confronted a white sheet of drawing paper. Back in the early 1960s, working on the city of the future, I could do little more than leave the white paper white. All I could draw were broken fragments, melted and fused, deformed and distorted, which created objects that were only formed by chance. So to a certain extent, that's one of the first narratives of our era, which to a certain extent is a dead-end narrative. 
to a certain extent, it allows for nothing but white paper and a spectacle of a, of a world in, in ruins. But uh, in that trauma, in that <coughs> void, uh, Isasaki managed uh, to build. He built, as you know, we got the Prisca Prize this year. He built uh, a, an extraordinary number of extraordinarily interesting buildings. But for me, the most poignant were three shelters uh, that he built in the Mojave Desert, uh, just outside Joshua Tree. And those three shelters were shelters that were geared to the seasons. Uh, a shelter for uh, the spring and summer, uh, a shelter for the summer and autumn, and a shelter for the winter. Uh, a series of shelters that were just poised, uh, literally one could sleep in those shelters, under those shelters, but actually punctuated the void as, as, as slightly and as lightly as they could. They were, for him, uh, the response, if you like, to the rubble of nature, uh, the organization of, of, of the simple, plain uh, structures of, uh, of uh, habitable life. Back, if you like, to that primitive hut, that primitive shelter uh, that uh, began architectural uh, visits. Okay? The, out of this, of course, came not utopia, but dystopia. A whole series of, uh, of projects from Archizoom, from Super Studio. Uh, dystopias which were, uh, as you can see in this uh, extraordinary section, no more than the entire uh, version of a city underground, an entire bunker city uh, with uh, uh, life uh, at the top only under these uh, uh, biospheres uh, and life at the bottom in, uh, in transit, uh, but level after level after level after level, or uh, us, our entire civilization returned to nothing on a flat uh, grid of, of ground and uh, rendered into nomads again, uh, nomads uh, uh, with, uh, with uh, nothing more nor less than what we started with. Against this uh, narrative of hopelessness came a narrative of hope, a, a narrative which uh, began in the uh, 1960s, uh, was deeply intensified by the uh, gas shortages uh, across the world of the early 1970s, and which uh, were immediately countered and, uh, and thrust back uh, by, by what we now call a kind of postmodern historicist, almost a narcissistic vision of, uh, of architecture resisting uh, the world and resisting the great narratives. But this narrative, uh, which is a narrative of ecological catastrophe, uh, but it, which is in the 1970s at least uh, not a dead end narrative. If you listen to Bucky Fuller, if you listen to John McHale, uh, you listen to their experiments, you listen to their warnings, and you listen to their uh, graphs uh, in his, uh, uh, in This Is Tomorrow, uh, this is the actual exhibition uh, poster for the uh, shelter that uh, Peter Smithson uh, designed as the uh, catastrophic post-apocalyptic shelter, uh, you can see that in the in the in the ceiling of this uh, in the ceiling of this uh, nice little London uh, row house, which uh, was filled with uh, all kinds of American consumer products, uh, was a very special kind of ceiling. It was a ceiling uh, that McHale had cut from a Life uh, magazine. It was the photograph, the first satellite photograph, long before uh, we'd reached the moon, the first satellite photograph of the Earth. For, for McHale, uh, that ceiling registered the demand of This Is Tomorrow in 1956 to look beyond uh, the small uh, rooms of uh, London comfort and American uh, consumer products and to look at the Earth uh, from a point of uh, observation uh, that would give us, uh, as he said uh, in his uh, two extraordinary books of uh, uh, 1969 and 1971, The Future of the Future and the Ecological Context. The Ecological Context is a book that could have been written yesterday and it should be written again and published tomorrow. It has a full analysis of the resources of the earth, the full analysis of population growth, a full analysis of climate, and a full analysis of global warming already in 1971. Uh, it was an analysis which he hoped would lead to action. So this ecological narrative at this moment was a hopeful narrative. It was a hopeful narrative for those who believed the technology uh, would solve the problem. Here, uh, Raina Bannum is sitting in the bubble 
Uh, here, Archigram is uh, seeing a living city developing out of uh, the technological artifacts uh, that uh, had emerged in the space program until the last narrative. This is my last narrative, and I'm questioning at this point uh, whether it is a narrative, and we can have a discussion about this. This is a word that has come into, uh, come into use uh, very commonly over the past uh, 10 years uh, in various disciplines. Uh, uh, literary critics are talking about the Anthropocene, biologists are talking about the Anthropocene, uh, geologists are talking about the Anthropocene, uh, climatologists are talking about the Anthropocene, and now architects too are talking about the Anthropocene. The Anthropocene, of course, is that moment where uh, in, uh, in 2000, uh, Paul Cousin uh, tried to coin a word for mankind's uh, activities on the earth, where it started, and there was a great debate about where it started. Did it start with the Industrial Revolution? Did it start before that? Did it start with Faraday's electrical experiments? Where did it start? Did it start with uh, the Royal Society in the, in the 1600s? When did the deleterious movement of man on the earth begin to destroy the earth. And the Anthropocene, as far as uh, Paul Krusen and others have it, has an end. It's an end date. The end date is at the moment where everything is destroyed on the earth, where there's a complete meltdown of animal and uh, plant and, uh, and human, human life. And I'm now wondering uh, whether or not, and many uh, critics of this particular constitution, this particular narrative of life on the earth, uh, has led to a kind of helplessness, a kind of hopelessness. Uh, many of my students say, well, what am I going to do? If it's going to end, is there anything we can do? Uh, I give the examples uh, uh, of uh, a number of, uh, of kinds of activity, but simply I give the examples of a, an activity that, uh, that uh, emerged uh, just after the the second great nuclear catastrophe, which is also a tsunami catastrophe at Fukushima uh, in Japan, uh, where Toyo Ito, the architect, brought together a number of his young students, including uh, co collectives like uh, Atelier Bawao, uh, to, uh, to, to work uh, on the ruins, to establish an architecture that would rebuild something. Not to rebuild the community that existed before, but to talk to the community that were the community of survivors. And in a very moving uh, uh, presentation uh, that I heard from the Atelier Bauer uh, la, two weeks ago uh, in the United States, uh, they demonstrated the way in which they talked to the survivors as a, as a collective group, the survivors who were bonded together by necessity. They never met each other, uh, but they were bonded together in order to make food, in order to make shelter, and so on. Uh, they had formed a kind of community. Uh, and that community was with Toyo Ito and the architects working in Fukushima, still now working in Fukushima, as uh, the radiation is, uh, is uh, to a certain extent mediated, as some of it will never be mediated, as uh, certain levels of, uh, of construction are, are, are pointed to. They are working to uh, build a, a community out of very simple materials, out of reusable materials, materials that are are left, materials which are, can be uh, shaped uh, sometimes by hand, sometimes by machine, machinery, but an intensive and active engagement in the now as opposed to a hopeless uh, sense of the then or the when. And so to a certain extent, uh, I would advocate a, uh, a moment of reflection as to whether the narratives that we're now talking to ourselves uh, shape our activity are the right narratives for a continuous set of events that are more and more going to shape our lives uh, and the architecture that's important for those events. Uh, that is uh, for you as students and architects uh, to invent and I'd be very happy to uh, receive your uh, instructions and to lecture on the possible narratives of a present architecture next time. Thank you.
Are you gonna? Yes. Are you gonna tell him what I said? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Λοιπόν, θα προσπαθήσω να το κάνω πολύ συνοπτικό και ελπίζω να είμαι ακριβής. Γιατί τα άλλαζε κιόλας συνέχεια. Λοιπόν, ε, καταρχήν σε σχέση με το ζήτημα της άμεσης επικαιρότητας στην πυρκαγιά, στην Παναγία των Παρισίων, ε, μπορούμε να βλέπουμε πάλι και τις εικόνες ίσως τα γρήγορα, αν μπορέσουμε να ταυτίσουμε το ρυθμό. Ε, Αναφέρθηκε ο Άντωνη Βίτλερ στο προηγούμενο του βομβαρδισμού της καταστροφής, τέλος πάντων, κατά τον Πρώτο Παγκόσμιο Πόλεμο του Καθεδρικού Ναού της Ρέμς ε, και ταυτόχρονα μίλησε με ένα και από, με, για ένα και, ε, από τα παραδείγματα στα οποία αναφέρεται και η διάλεξη, δηλαδή την αναστήλωση και την ολοκλήρωση, την αποκατάσταση, θα λέγαμε, της ιδέας περί της Νότρου Ντάμ, περί των Παναγι... της Παναγίας των Παρισίων, από τον Βιολέ Λεντίκ στο 19ο αιώνα. Και υπενθύμησε το ότι ευτυχώς το κομμάτι τουλάχιστον που κυρίως έχει καταστραφεί από την πυρκαγιά είναι αυτό το οποίο σχετίζεται με την πιο πρόσφατη φάση του μνημείου που είναι η φάση της επέμβασης, της παρέμβασης τέλο πάντων του Βιολέ Λεντίκ. Ε, το ζήτημα αυτό μας έθεσε ήδη εξ αρχής την βασική, θα λέγαμε, ειδοποιώ διαφορά, το βασικό δίπολο μεταξύ του ιδεατού και του πραγματικού. Όπως αυτό εμφανίστηκε σε πάρα πολλές από τις ε, μεγάλες αφηγήσεις που χαρακτήρισαν τον αρχιτεκτονικό λόγο διαχρονικά. Για παράδειγμα, και μένουμε για λίγο ακόμα στο παράδειγμα των δύο καθεδρικών ναών, ε, η αντίληψη του Βιολέλε για την ολοκληρωμένη στιλιστική αποκατάσταση, βασιζόταν σε μία λογική η οποία θεωρούσε ότι η αποκατάσταση μπορεί να ισοδυναμεί ακόμα και με βελτίωση του μνημείου μέσω της εξειδανίκευσης, θα λέγαμε, που προσπαθούσε να πετύχει και ο ίδιος. Ερχόμενος να παρέμβει αρκετά δραστικά στην πραγματικότητα την οποία είχε παραλάβει μέχρι τότε. Ε, αντίθετα με τον Βιολέ Λεντίκ, ο Ράσκιν την ίδια περίοδο ε, στην ουσία διαπίστωνε σχεδόν την αδυναμία της σύγχρονης κοινωνίας, της ε, βιομηχανικής εποχής και των, της τεχνικής και της τέχνης της εποχής να μπορέσουν να συνεχίσουν, θα λέγαμε, επί ίσης ώρες και με την ίδια ποιότητα ε, να ολοκληρώσουν το έργο των μεσαιωνικών συντεχνιών και της μεσαιωνικής κοινωνίας. Οπότε, υπ' αυτή την έννοια, ο Ράσκιν μας καλούσε πιο πολύ να απέχουμε από σχεδόν οποιαδήποτε πράξη ε, ολοκλήρωσης εντός εισαγωγικών του μνημείου. Ο, στους ε, νόμους του Πλάτωνα, στο πέμπτο βιβλίο, γίνεται αναφορά σε αυτήν την κλασική ιδέα του, της ιδεατής κοινωνίας και ε, εκεί γίνεται αμέσως η διαπίστωση η οποία έχει εφαρμογή πάρα πολύ και στην αριστοτελική πολιτική ε, για την ανάγκη μία ιδέα, μία διατύπωση του απόλυτου να μπορεί ταυτόχρονα να διατυπωθεί και με τους όρους μιας δεύτερης ή και μιας τρίτης επιλογής οι οποίες στην ουσία ορίζουν τη σφαίρα του εφικτού. Ε, μέσα από αυτό το κλασικό θα λέγαμε δίπολο και δίλημα που ξεκινάει ήδη με, τη, με τα κείμενα του Πλάτωνα θα παρακολουθήσουμε ή παρακολουθήσαμε ήδη μία σειρά από αντίστοιχες διαλεκτικές που αναπτύχθηκαν ιστορικά ε, στην αρχιτεκτονική και στον αρχιτεκτονικό λόγο. Διαλεκτικές οι οποίες πάντοτε ταυτόχρονα χαρακτηρίζονταν από μία αναγκαστική σχεδόν αναφορά σε ένα εξωτερικό πεδίο, έξω αρχιτεκτονικό, το οποίο ξεκινάει καταρχήν να είναι η φιλοσοφία και ακολουθεί αμέσως μετά η ιστορία ή συνδυασμό των δύο. Στην περίπτωση του παραδείγματος του Πλάτωνα έχουμε, όπως και κατά την επίσκεψη θα λέγαμε χτες του ίδιου του Βίτλερ ε, στην Κνωσό, έχουμε την πρόσκληση ενός ξένου ειδικού, ενός Αθηναίου, 
στην Κρήτη προκειμένου να συζητήσουν το σχέδιο μιας ιδανικής πόλης. Περπατώντας από την Γνωσό προς το βουνό, προκειμένου να προσεγγίσουν και τον ίδιο το Δία και να τους εμπνεύσει, οι συζητητές, ο βασιλιάς Μίνωας, ο καλεσμένος του από την Αθήνα και η λοιπή σύμβουλή του και φίλοι, συνειδητοποιούν ότι πάρα πολύ γρήγορα ότι όλες οι αντιλήψεις που οι ίδιοι συνδιαμορφώνουν περί του ιδεατού δεν θα μπορούσαν τελικά παρά να ε, καταλήγουν στην ανάγκη για έναν έντιμο συμβιβασμό. Στην ανάγκη δηλαδή να διατυπωθούν ταυτόχρονα, θα λέγαμε, backup plans, τα οποία θα εξασφάλιζαν περισσότερο αυτό που σήμερα, και εδώ κάνω μια γέφυρα με το τέλος της διάλεξης, θα λέγαμε μια πιο βιώσιμη πρόταση. Δεν θα μείνουμε πολύ στις διαχρονικές συζητήσεις που χιλιάδες σχολιαστών και συγγραφέων έχουν κάνει πάνω σε, αυτή την... σε αυτό το κείμενο του Πλάτωνα. Αυτό που μας ενδιαφέρει όμως είναι αυτή η πρώτη παραδειγματική και υποδειγματική διαπίστωση της ανάγκης να μετακινηθούμε από το απόλυτο στην δεύτερη ή τρίτη καλύτερη διατύπωσή του. Και μάλιστα αυτή η ανάγκη ε, γίνεται κατανοητή όταν ερχόμαστε να αναφερθούμε ιδιαίτερα στο πεδίο του σχεδιασμού, της αρχιτεκτονικής και ίσως με αυτή την έννοια αυτό ε, οδηγεί και σε μια άλλη διαπίστωση ότι η ίδια η αρχιτεκτονική είναι εξ αρχής τοποθετημένη μέσα στο πλαίσιο αυτού του δεύτερου ή τρίτου καλύτερου. Ο Βιτρούβιος... Ερχόμενος και αυτός σαν μια νέα ιστορία, μια νέα αφήγηση και όχι ιστορία με την έννοια της επίσημης επιστήμης της αρχιτεκτονικής, προσπαθεί και αυτός να εντοπίσει τον σκοπό, την αξία, αυτό που δίνει νόημα στην αρχιτεκτονική. Και υπ' αυτή την έννοια καταφεύγει σε μια άλλη στρατηγική, αναζητά συνθετικές αρχές και μεθόδους που θα εξασφαλίσουν το ορθό αρχιτεκτονικό αποτέλεσμα. Η πρωτόγονη καλύβα, το καταφύγιο που περιγράφει και ο ίδιος ο Βιτρούδιος, γίνεται αντιληπτό ως εκείνο το παράδειγμα καταφυγίου που θα εμπνεύσει αργότερα κατά τον διαφωτισμό διατυπώσεις όπως του Αβάλλοζιέ, οι οποίες ταυτόχρονα μπαίνουν σε έναν ιστορικό ορίζοντα που παράγει την ίδια την έννοια της τυπολογίας που συνεχίζεται και εξελίσσεται τόσο στο 19ο αιώνα όσο και κατά τον 20ο αιώνα και ιδιαίτερα στο πρώτο μισό, αλλά και με την επανεπίσκεψη αυτού του όρου από τον Άλτο Ρώση, με αναφορά και στον ίδιο τον Κατχαμέντε Κινσή, που την, ε, ανέδειξε ιδιαίτερα την έννοια του τύπου στον 19ο αιώνα. Η αναφορά στην έννοια του τύπου μεταφέρει ίσως σε ένα καινούριο επίπεδο τον αρχιτεκτονικό λόγο. Ναι. Πιο γρήγορα. Ε, ακόμα πιο δύσκολο. Μεταφέρει τον αρχιτεκτονικό λόγο στο επίπεδο του να αναζητήσουμε στην ουσία και την ίδια την καταγωγή της αρχιτεκτονικής. Άρα, στην ουσία, εδώ ερχόμαστε να συνδεθούμε και με τον λόγο του ίδιου του Δαρβίνου και αυτή είναι μια νέα εξωαρχιτεκτονική νοηματοδότηση και νομιμοποίηση της αρχιτεκτονικής. Αναζητάμε στην ουσία... Αυτό το νόημα το κρυμμένο που κρυβόταν ήδη στις απαρχές της αρχιτεκτονικής ε, και το οποίο στην ουσία διατυπώνει τον νόμο, θα λέγαμε, με όρους και φυσικής που διέπει την εξέλιξη της αρχιτεκτονικής. Ερχόμαστε λοιπόν να μιλήσουμε για μια αρχιτεκτονική της προόδου, μια αρχιτεκτονική η οποία εξελίσσεται σταδιακά μέσα στο δεύτερο μισό του 20ου αιώνα και η οποία έρχεται να συμβαδίσει κάθε φορά μέσα από τις νέες της μορφές και τις νέες της γλώσσες με το πνεύμα της εποχής της. Πράγμα το οποίο φυσικά ως όρος αυτή η έννοια του Zeitgeist, του πνεύματος της εποχής, μας συνδέει ιδιαίτερα με το μοντέρνο κίνημα, το Le Corbusier και τη δική του εξιστόρηση, θα λέγαμε, αυτή της νομοτέλειας, όπως αυτή διατυπώθηκε στο, για μια αρχιτεκτονική, στο Βέργιν Αρχιτεκτήριο. Ο Νικόλαος Πέψνερ, γνωστός ιστορικός αρχιτεκτονική. Στην, Ευρωπαϊκ... στην ιστορία της Ευρωπαϊκής Αρχιτεκτονικής του 19ου αιώνα, 
κάνει μια άλλη θεμελιώδη διάκριση που καθοδήγησε, θα λέγαμε, την, τις αντιλήψεις μας για την εκτονική. Αυτή μεταξύ ενός χρηστικού οικοδομήματος, ενός κτηρίου και ενός έργου τέχνης, το οποίο έχει μνημιακή πρόθεση και ταυτότητα. Ο πρώτος παγκόσμιος πόλεμος και οι ε, ε, τεράστιες καταστροφές αλλά και η Σοβιετική Επανάσταση του 1917 μαζί και με άλλες κινηματικές διαδικασίες που θα λέγαμε σάρωσαν τον πλανήτη εκείνη την περίοδο έρχονται ταυτόχρονα να θέσουν ξανά αυτά τα οποία μέχρι τώρα είπαμε ε, μέσα στην προοπτική του κατά πόσον επιθυμούμε σχεδόν μια καταστροφή προκειμένου να γεννήσουμε το καινούριο ή μένουμε περισσότερο στη διαπίστωση της καταστροφικής δύναμης που έχουμε αποκτήσει. Και εκεί μπαίνει και το πλαίσιο της πρωτοπορίας της Avantgarde. Ο αποκαλυπτικός λόγος που χαρακτηρίζει τα μανιφέστα τόσο των θετικών, θα λέγαμε, προοδευτικών μοντέλων που αναπτύσσονται εκείνη την περίοδο, όσο και τα ε, μηδενιστικά μοντέλα που αναπτύχθηκαν εκείνη την περίοδο, ε, ενδεχομένως ε, απηχούνται στον μεταπυρηνικό κόσμο και στον μεταπολεμικό κόσμο που έχετε να διαπιστώσει πλέον στην πράξη, άρα θα λέγαμε αυτή η σχεδόν τοπική δυνατότητα της καταστροφής γίνεται πράξη, μετά την πυρηνική καταστροφή της Ιαπωνίας, τον πόλεμο της Ιαπωνίας και το ολοκαύτωμα του εβραϊκού πληθυσμού της Ευρώπης. Η έννοια του τραύματος ξεκινάει ήδη από το Μεσοπόλεμο και αναπτύσσεται ιδιαίτερα με τα πολεμικά, τόσο σε αρχιτέκτονες όπως ο Αράτα Ισοζάκη, όσο σε καλλιτέχνες όπως ο Κλέ και ο Κλίμπτ, γίνεται, θα λέγαμε, ένα ίχνος το οποίο αποτυπώνεται σχεδόν πάντα σε οποιαδήποτε καλλιτεχνική και αρχιτεκτονική δυνατότητα που αναπτύσσεται από εκεί και πέρα. Οι Άλισον και Πίτερ Σμίρσον, όχι ο Άλι, ε, ναι, στο, στη συμμετοχή στην έκθεση House of the Future, το σπίτι του μέλλοντος, στην μεγάλη έκθεση του 55-56, ε, σε αντίθεση με, με τις κυρίως θετικιστικές απεικονίσεις του μέλλοντος που μας προσφέρει η τεχνολογία που διέπουν αυτήν την έκθεση, ε, συ, συμμετέχουν με ένα σχεδόν ηρωνικό σύμβολο αυτών των ελάχιστων πραγμάτων που πρέπει να πάρουμε μαζί μας σε αυτό το καταφύγιο στο οποίο θα κλειστούμε αναγκαστικά λόγω της επικείμενης καταστροφής. Τον ουρανό, λίγη γη και δεν θυμάμαι το τρίτο. Ε, και καταλήγω... Δεν ξέρω γιατί... Μην... Κατέχουμε. Με τον Γκίντεμπορ, ο οποίος στην ουσία μιλά και αυτός για τη μέρα της κρίσης, και, για, και μέσα από το κείμενό του «Γεωπολιτική της αφύπνισης», «Hibernation», ε, στην ουσία αναφέρεται πάρα πολύ στο πώς ε, μέσα από μια καμπάνια που ξεκίνησε με τον πρόεδρο Κένεντι το 1961, δημιουργήθηκε μια τεράστια αγορά προσωπικών οικογενειακών καταφυγείων απέναντι στον πυρηνικό πόλεμο στην Αμερική. Μια αγορά που παρήγαγε πάνω από, ε, αν κατάλαβα καλά, 50 εκατομμύρια τέτοια ε, προϊόντα που προσέφερε όχι απλά ένα νέο καταναλωτικό προϊόν το οποίο άλλαξε την ίδια την έννοια της χρήσης της έννοιας του καταφυγίου γιατί ξαφνικά το καταφύγιο είναι κάτι που είναι ένα σημαντικό συμπλήρωμα του ιδεατού προαστιακού σπιτιού της Αμερικής. Είναι κάτι αντίστοιχο με το σίδερο και το εκκοντήσιον. Ε, αλλά ταυτόχρονα αυτό παρήγαγε, θα λέγαμε, μια, ένα νέα ιδεατό πρότυπο για την πόλη του αύριο και την κοινωνία του αύριο. Άρα έχουμε αυτόν τον, αυτή την πολεοδομία της απελπισίας που παράγει η παράνοια του ψυχρού πολέμου. Και καταλήγουμε με τα δύο τελευταία παραδείγματα που επηρεάζουν τα τελευταία δέκα χρόνια κυρίως τον, το δεύτερο, το πρώτο έχει κάποιες δεκαετίες, τον αρχιτεκτονικό λόγο, αυτό της οικολογίας και της έννοιας του ανθρωπόκαινου, το οποίο προέρχεται από συνδυαστικέ διαπιστώσεις και μελέτες τόσο στο επίπεδο της ανθρωπολογίας όσο της ε, γεωγραφίας και της γεωλογίας. Η οικολογία έχει διαπιστώσει, θα λέγαμε, την αρνητική πορεία που έχει, πάρει, που έχει προσδώσει στην εξέλιξη του πλανήτη η παρέμβαση του ανθρώπου και έχουμε όλοι μας υπόψη τις, τα, τις προσπάθειες υπό τον Buckminster Fuller και τον Τζον Μακχέιλ για μια νέα αρχιτεκτονική η οποία θα προσπαθήσει να σώσει το, το Space Earth, τη, τη, τη γη, στην περιπλάνησή της προς την καταστροφή. Ε, 
Αυτή η έννοια της, του, του κατεπίγοντος, την ανάγκη για επιβίωση, η οποία προσέδωσε ένα νέο διαφορετικό ρόλο τότε στην αρχιτεκτονική, αλλά σήμερα ενδεχομένως έχει καταλήξει κυρίως στα πιστοποιητικά Lead και Briam ή στην όλη παγκόσμια ατζέντα για την πράσινη οικονομία. Η έννοια του ανθρωπόκαινου, που τουλάχιστον στα αρχιτεκτονικά πράγματα βρέθηκε κυρίως μετά το 2000, ε, μπαίνει σαν μια προσπάθεια να βρεθεί μια συνολική θεώρηση της ανθρώπινης παρουσίας στον πλανήτη και του ρόλου με την οποία και η παρέμβασή του μέσα από την αρχιτεκτονική και την πόλη του ανθρώπου έχει δημιουργήσει μια καινούργια κατάσταση στη φύση. Αυτή η έννοια έχει ε, τεθεί υπό, αυστηρή, υπό ένα αυστηρά κριτικό πλαίσιο από διανοούμενους όπως η Donna Haraway, οι οποίοι ε, επισημαίνουν και οι οποίες επισημαίνουν κυρίως την απλοϊκότητα με βάση την οποία ε, αυτή η περίπλοκη διαχρονική σχέση του ανθρώπου με τον πλανήτη του και των ανθρώπινων κοινωνιών με τον πλανήτη του έχει εκφραστεί με, με διαφορετικούς τρόπους κάθε φορά και υπό μία έννοια φαίνεται να, να παράγει μια, έναν απόλυτο πεσημισμό η οποία διατυπώνεται και σε projects όπως θα διατυπώσω μόνο απλά ένα το μαθαίνοντας να πεθαίνουμε στο ανθρωπόκαινο. Παρ' όλα αυτά όλα τα παραπάνω, τα προηγηθέντα παραδείγματα τελικά έδωσαν μέσα από την χρήση και την κατάχρηση της έννοιας της ιστορίας και με τις αφηγήσεις που επιστράτευσαν έχει προσδώσει τελικά στην αρχιτεκτονική και τους αρχιτέκτονες πολλούς διαφορετικούς ρόλους και μέσα και σήμερα ακόμα, μέσα σε αυτή τη συζήτηση για το ανθρωπόκαινο και την οικολογία, έχουμε πάρα πολύ θετικά και ενδιαφέροντα παραδείγματα, όπως αυτή του Ατέλια Μπαουάου, του μαθητών του Τόγιο Ήτο και της κολεκτίβας Arcade, στο, για παράδειγμα ως προς τον τρόπο με τον οποίο παρενέβησαν για την αποκατάσταση των θυμάτων της Φουκουσίμα και των πόλεων Τη Ιαπωνία μετά από την τεράστια αυτή καταστροφή. Στο μοντέλο με το οποίο αυτοί εργάστηκαν, κινητοποιώντα ε, του επιζώντε αλλά και τι κοινότητε ε, και δουλεύοντα μαζί του ε, ε, και με του γραφειοκράτε και του υπόλοιπου ενδιαφερόμενου, μπορούμε ίσω να αναζητήσουμε μια νέα σύνθεση αυτή τη έννοια τη καταστροφή αλλά και του τοπικού, θα λέγαμε, λόγου που πάντοτε τελικά φαίνεται ότι υπήρχε στην αρχιτεκτονική. Ευχαριστώ. We can start with possible questions and interventions. Uh, since we I have, no we have quite a few here, I would need to ask you to, uh, in contrast to me, uh, speak as uh, loud and clear as possible, and if possible, not to take too much time because we need to hear more people. Thank you. Δεν βλέπω τίποτα. Ε, Πείτε κάποιος, για, ε, να σηκωθεί απ' ε, για να τον βλέπω. Someone has to uh, stand up to ask questions because we don't see you. The light is against us. Less light, please, to paraphrase Getter. No questions? Should I ask myself? I abuse the microphone. Okay. You have a question? Do you remember the question I asked you yesterday? Which was? I don't remember. The one you liked and you told me to ask today. Okay. Do so you ask it. Yeah? Do yeah, go, go ahead. I'll try and answer it. I don't remember it. Oh. <laughs> you remember what it was? Uh, not at all, no. I was too uh, tied up in Nassos and uh, what can I tell you? Ah, uh, I forgot. I, I remembered. You remember? Stop, stop. Yeah. Okay, the question is, we talked about paradigms, basically, about models of thinking about what is right and what is wrong and how to do it. And we described an overall evolution of these paradigms in architectural discourse. The question would be if, if maybe today we are at the end of the idea of the paradigm. They, they will not, that, that what has ended is not in a way society or the planet or architecture, but the sheer idea 
of how an example, a paradigm, a way of doing things as a concept is not a valid way to think anymore. I, I would answer that in the same way I would answer those who say history has come to an end. I would answer that it's impossible for history to come to an end. It's, it's possible for modes of writing history or modes of understanding history or modes of being historical to move from one paradigm to another. Uh, but I don't think it's possible uh, for any thinking being to act without a, uh, uh, with a, without a, a paradigm of some sort. There is this discussion, to give it the context of our discussion yesterday, about the end of theory, which comes out also of uh, cybernetics and, for example, the big data, and how by following constant flow of gigabytes of data, what you need to do is not try to interpret why something you observe as a phenomenon is actually happening, but sort of try to follow what is happening. You've just enunciated a, a new theory of, uh, of uh, a new a, paradigm of yeah, reading data. It's again a theory. Yeah. A, yeah. a theory against theory. Yeah. Well, no, a theory against the theory that was. Yeah. But maybe the theory to come. Yeah. But, you know, that's, contested, that's contestable in relationship to whether it operates as a way of uh, understanding how to move in architecture, right? Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? If there are no questions, then you can ask we one. could move towards the, or have all the, have all the pastries been eaten? <laughs> all right, thank you very much.